Good morning, one and all present here. I, Ikra Siddiqui, heartily welcome you all to this special lecture. I welcome the eminent speaker of the day, Dr. Parthar Chauhan, who is here to share his valuable knowledge with us. I will also present my warm welcome to our beloved principal, sir, Dr. J.M. Malikarjanaya, Vice Principal Anita M.J. Ma'am, and IQSA Coordinator Dr. Manoj Kumar V. Hiremat in their absence here. I would also like to welcome Surendra, Secretary RCCH, Dr. S.K. Aruni, Founder, Bangalore Historian Society, in their absence here. I will also take this opportunity to welcome our beloved faculty members and my dear friends. Now I would like to request Ms. Avantika to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Parthar Chauhan. Good morning, everyone. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today's event, Dr. Parth R. Chauhan. Sir is an associate professor in the Indian Institute of Science Education and Research, Mohali. He has completed his BA in archeology span with a minor as history from Rutgers University, USA, and his MA in archeology span and ancient history from Deccan College Postgraduate and Research Institute, Pune, in the year 1998. He has also completed his PhD in archaeology from the University of Sheffield, UK, in 2005. Sir has researched on various interesting fields such as Indian prehistory, stone tools, vertebrate paleontology, rock art studies, paleoanthropology. His main areas of interest are stone tools, vertebrate fossils and rock art of paleoanthropology, sorry, rock art of South Asia. Currently, he is heading the Narmada Basin Paleoanthropology Project, the goal of which is to understand patterns of human occupation and adaptations in the region over the span of at least one million years and also search for additional hominin fossils. During his doctoral work, he has also carried out research in the Shivalik Hills, work which is ongoing and involves targeting different types of paleoanthropological data sets to investigate a possible hominin presence in South Asia older than the Asholin, which is older than 1.5 million years. In addition, he is also analyzing microlithic stone tools from a cave in Konkan, Maharashtra. In collaboration with the government of Maharashtra and collaborating with Charutar University of Science and Technology and other colleges to understand the co-evolution of humans and ostriches in the Tapi Basin. Sir is also interested in flint napping and utilizing the resulting stones, stone tools to understand the roles of culture, function, technology, and raw material selection and the associated impacts on such materials as stone, wood, and bone. Sir has taught subjects like advanced theory and method in paleoanthropology, field course in paleoanthropology and allied disciplines, archaeology of the world, a cultural quest into our global past. He has also completed research projects like the first global culture, lower paleolithic Asholin adaptations, at the two ends of Asia, UGC, India-Israel Joint Research Program, documentation, study and scientific analysis of rock art in Raisin District, Madhya Pradesh, PR Chauhan and Salim Sheikh, ICHR, New Delhi, and many more. On behalf of the KLE Law College staff and students, I welcome you to the event, sir, and I would request him to share his insights on the topic, Ape to Human, Evolution of Human in India. Thank you.
Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the college uh, and the administration for inviting me uh, to, to give this opportunity for giving a talk to you all. Basically, my, my research is very unique and all of you as lawyers or future lawyers, I should say, uh, will hopefully get some insights into a different subject. Uh, some of you might have heard of these things uh, from uh, documentaries and uh, other newspaper sources, for example, of new discoveries. So I'm here to just give a very brief overview of the uh, human evolution scenario in a global context. And then I'll talk about the relevance of India, uh, what big questions we're asking, what evidence we look for, and key uh, problems in understanding human evolution. So just to situate my subject uh, in the uh, time, time frame, basically, we have three different types of archaeology. Historical archaeology, which we focus on only on written records or after knowledge of writing. Uh, Proto-historic archaeology, which is the time period when domestication and agriculture begins. And finally, we have prehistoric archaeology, which is the prehistoric past or before the knowledge of writing. And that is the longest period, about more than 3 million years. And my subject is specifically paleoanthropology. So anthropology means study of humans and paleo means ancient. So paleoanthropology is basically a multidisciplinary approach to understanding human evolution. We use biology, chemistry, geology, and all uh, subjects to understand the human evolution from a, a comprehensive perspective. So what do we exactly study? Uh, many of you know that prehistory includes fossils. That's one thing. Second thing is we also have uh, stone tools because it's often called the Stone Age, but you have to keep in mind that they were also using other materials such as wood, uh, antler, um, ivory, bamboo. There are many other materials they were using, but stone has survived. So that's why it's called the Stone Age. Uh, so we have uh, stone tools, uh, human fossils, animal fossils, as well as sediments, rocks, uh, paintings. So we study many different types of uh, evidences scientifically. And then if you want to reconstruct the past habitats or past environments, whether they're living in a forest environment or grasslands, we look at uh, the beginning of uh, how evolution happened in specific context, like ancient vegetation, uh, the flora, the fauna, what kind of animal life there was. So we try to reconstruct everything uh, based on these evidences. And then we have specific symbolic behavior. For example, human burials, that's a symbolic behavior. Making uh, necklaces, uh, music, uh, painting in the caves. That is all symbolic behavior. Behavior that is extra or beyond daily survival. And all of this evidence varies in terms of frequency, age, distribution. So it's, it's very important to understand how it is preserved, uh, not only in India, but other places also. So the key question we ask as scientists or paleoanthropologists is what factors were responsible for biological changes, behavioral changes, and then we have technological changes in human evolution. How did different species evolve? Uh, why did they change? Why did some species become extinct? Why did Homo sapiens survive and become dominant on the planet? And how did the relationship with uh, humans and environments evolve also? So now I'll be getting into a brief review of the African evidence, then coming into the global evidence, and then coming to India. The time frame we're looking at is basically the last 7 million years which is end of the Miocene, entire Pliocene, entire Pleistocene. Now these names are given for a reason in geology because we have global changes uh, happening for the last uh, uh, 5 billion years, for example, the age of the earth. And all of you are familiar with, uh, I think, glacial cycles, glacial and interglacial cycles. So we look at uh, changes over 100,000 years, over 5 million years to see what the pattern is. Every few million years, there's a change in climate some species, animal species become extinct and new species emerge. And this includes humans. So why do these changes happen is based on global uh, factors. Um, I won't talk about the relationships of all these different human species because it's a very debated topic. Um, but we do know that certain species became extinct and had no role to play in human evolution. But at the same time, we have Homo sapiens emerging much, much uh, later. Uh, so it takes 7 million years at least for Homo sapiens to evolve. 
Um, we have four main groups of uh, early humans are called uh, hominins. The earliest hominins from about 7 million to 4 million. Then we have the Australopithecines. And I think some of you might be knowing uh, the famous species, Lucy. Lucy is Australopithecus afarensis. Um, that is part of the Australopithecine group. Then we have another set of uh, hominins called robust Australopithecines. So they're separated into two different types, very robust ones and very gracile ones. And finally, we have the Homo genus members. So the earliest genus, uh, our, our genus, Homo, appears around 2.8 million years ago. So that's a very long time uh, for it to exist and evolve. So these are just basic groups. And we are still finding new species in Africa and in uh, other parts of the world, actually. So how did this change happen? Going from apes living in the trees and then walking on uh, two, two legs, basically, bipedalism, we have a change in ecology. This is only one factor. There are other factors also. Uh, change in uh, habitat preference, change in food, food or diet, for example. This is just one factor because we have evidence that forest environments became smaller and grassland environments became more widespread. So we had to gradually adapt to the grasslands or savanna. You see, you've seen, must have seen savanna images uh, in Africa, for example, the Serengeti Plains and all these places. So we had two options, either stick with the forest, which are shrinking, or adapt to grasslands. And this uh, process of bipedalism, it's not sudden. It takes a long time, maybe 1 million years, 2 million years. And it takes longer even for it to become in the same way we walk today. The earliest hominins were walking differently, and we walk differently. So it took a long time for proper bipedalism to actually happen. Maybe in the beginning, they were coming on the ground for one hour and then going back to the trees. And gradually, it increased and became a regular behavior. Another advantage of bipedalism or standing on two legs, you can look across the savanna for predators, lions, cheetah, leopards. It, you, can, you can see where the next landmark is for walking, for example. There's many, many advantages. And the, one of the biggest advantage of walking on two legs is your hands are free. You can carry things, you can throw things, you can defend yourself, and most importantly, you can start making tools. The earliest tools are probably not stone tools. There are probably other materials, and I'll show you that example. So the earliest salmonids are only found in parts of East Africa and Central Africa. Very few evidences, and <clears throat> most of it is fragmentary. And some people debate uh, that whether it's really humans or, or whether it's apes. So it's not clear. And imagine that transition that happens. Seven million years ago, what happens is humans separate from the chimpanzees. Chimpanzees, we share over 98% of the DNA with them. So that means we separated from them most recently. Before that, we separated from gorillas, for example. So these species, uh, we don't exactly know sometimes because the skeleton is incomplete. If you don't have the entire part of the skull, or leg bones or arm bones, we cannot tell if it was bipedal or quadrupedal or living in the trees. It's not always easy. We need the entire, or not entire, but maximum skeleton possible, maximum evidence possible. Another evidence we have of walking on two legs is footprints. Footprints have been preserved as fossil traces. So besides the bones becoming fossilized, we have evidence of walking uh, on the landscape. And this evidence is preserved because uh, this is a famous site in Tanzania. Uh, what happened is there was a volcanic eruption. All the volcanic ash uh, distributed in the landscape. Then there was rain, and that created a natural mud. And then the humans and other animals started walking on this, and that dried up like natural concrete. And then uh, the whole evidence became buried uh, by various processes, by rivers, other processes. And then in the future, three million years later, these same processes resulted in the exposure of the footprints and found by the scientists. And if you study the footprints, we can get very good information about uh, the gait, about the possible weight of the individual, possible height also, the stature. Um, and in this case, they restudied the fossils a few years back, and they found out that maybe it's representing two species of humans and not only one. So this is a new discovery from evidence that was known for the last 50 years. And then, of course, we have the fossil evidence. If you have just a skull, 
we can still tell if it was bipedal or quadrupedal because the foramen magnum, which is the place where the spine connects, is underneath. If the foramen magnum is underneath, then usually the individual is bipedal. If the foramen magnum is in the back, then the animal is quadrupedal, like a dog, for example. And then we have various changes happening. From about uh, 5 million years to 3 million years, we have a uh, decrease in certain features. For example, the sagittal crest you see here on the skull, can anyone guess what the function is of the sagittal crest? For example, today, uh, gorillas have this. Gorillas have this, but chimpanzees don't. We also don't. Can anyone guess why we have why we had this sagittal crest? Why gorillas have this sagittal crest? No? It has something to do with diet. Gorillas eat very hard food, so they need very large chewing muscles. And those chewing muscles attach to the top of the head. When you chew, if you notice, if you chew and put your hand on your head, you'll feel the muscles moving if you move, if you talk or chew. Those muscles attach here. And over time, our features change because of evolution. And most of these species become extinct because of uh, climate change, change in habitat, change in vegetation. They could not adapt. Another reason for extinction is competition. If the genus Homo is increasing in the population, then Australopithecines will eventually become extinct because of competition. Competition for food, competition for resources, uh, space, many things. And then again, looking at the basic anatomy, you can see that the Australopithecines on the left are made for more climbing trees. They have longer arms, their fingers are curved to hold branches, but in uh, Homo, uh, we have major changes, not just increase in size, but we have increase in brain size, for example. Our faces become flat. Our arms become shorter. Our whole carriage and center of gravity changes. So there's a lot of changes happening between different species. And eventually, many of the Australopithecines become extinct. And keep in mind that those uh, species that served you in this tree, they're not one after the other. Sometimes they're contemporary. So we have Australopithecine species contemporary with early genus of Homo sometimes. So just uh, key milestones in human evolution, according to a timeline. Seven million years ago, we have bipedalism, maybe even older. 3.3 uh, million years ago, we have the oldest stone tools. Uh, 2.9 million years, we have the oldest evidence of meat eating. This is based on fossil evidence. Uh, then we have the earliest appearance of genus Homo. We, we leave Africa more than 2 million years ago, and I'll show you that evidence. Then we have the oldest evidence of fire making uh, or fire control, 1.4 million. And then we have uh, species evolving in different locations. The Homo sapiens is evolving, appearing in Africa, but the Neanderthals, which all of you are familiar with, are evolving in Europe. They're appearing there for the first time. So we have human evolution taking place outside of Africa also, not just Africa. And then we have multiple dispersals between 200,000 and 50,000 of Homo sapiens. Sometimes uh, the earlier populations they reach, for example, uh, Israel or Levant. Uh, later on, they reach China, India, and Europe. And we like to look at human evolution from an environmental perspective. What was the climate exactly? And when we say climate, we look at long-term uh, changes. For example, for uh, 1 million years, it could have been a very humid environment. And then for 2 million years after that, it could have been a very dry environment. So how are the humans, animals uh, uh, adapting to these changes? Are they becoming extinct? Are they adapting? Are they mixing? Are they migrating? So all of these things we look at uh, from a holistic perspective. And of course, temperature changes as well. And here we have various technologies of stone tools. Uh, the earliest is 3.3 million. And just uh, about two weeks ago, they reported another technology, of older one, 2.9 million years old. So after 2.9, the technology so far is continuous. We have gaps only in the beginning for now, between 3.3 million and 2.9 million. That's 400,000 years. Right now, we don't have any evidence found. But in the future, we'll probably fill the gap. Maybe we might find stone tools older than 3.3 million. But what is challenging is if you find older stone tools, you can see on the, the, the images, they're very simple tools. 
the more simpler the tools in the past, the more difficult it is to distinguish between human-made tools and tools made by apes. Because you might have seen documentaries that chimpanzees also uh, use tools. So if you find something that is 4 million years old, very simple, how do we know who made it without fossil evidence? It could have been made by a chimpanzee. It could have been made by a human. And then we have multiple technologies um, emerging slowly. And the first three technologies are emerging in Africa. But when they spread everywhere, for example, the Ashulian, you can see in the center with the pointed hand axe, when that spreads to other places and establishes in, in, in Europe and India and China, then we have multiple origins, not only single origins. So anytime a population establishes itself or technology establishes itself, then we have multiple origins across the world and mixing as well. Here's an example of how we find stone tools. We walk along uh, eroded or weathered sections. It could be a stream bed or along a river, and we find individual artifacts like this. This is an example of a hand axe that was utilized and then discarded onto a floodplain environment. This means that the humans were moving around the landscape carrying tools with them. And they came across an animal or they hunted an animal, they did the butchery and discarded the artifact. And that flooding happened, the river flooded and buried the artifact. And in the future, the archaeologists found it. There are other sites we have sometimes hundreds or thousands of artifacts. This can represent multiple visits to the same site again and again. It can be in one generation, it can go over many, many generations. Here's an example of what I was talking about of chimpanzees using uh, tools as well. They're using these sticks, which are actually modified to catch termites. They eat termites. Now, first of all, this kind of evidence will never get fossilized. Bones get fossilized, but wooden tools like this won't get fossilized. And if it does get fossilized by chance, as archaeologists, we won't recognize it as a tool because it looks like any other stick. So you can see how challenging it is to recognize tools beyond stone tools. Then we have uh, <clears throat> chimpanzees also using spears sometimes for hunting. The main question is now, imagine, did these chimpanzees learn these technologies on their own? Did they invent them on their own? Or did they learn it by watching another human do it millions of years ago? We don't know. We don't know how old these chimpanzee technologies are. One million years, 10 million years, we don't know. Then I was talking about bone tools and antler tools. Antler is basically horn of uh, deer, uh, antelope, all these things. So those are also used as tools. Here's an example of a spear. Wooden spears, and on the top, on the right, top right, you can see the horse skull. So these spears were used to hunt horses in Germany 400,000 years ago, maybe by Neanderthals, maybe by a different species, we don't know. So you can see that in very rare cases, wooden tools get preserved, but something that is millions of years old will probably not get preserved. This has to be, uh, for organic material to be preserved, it has to be underwater for a long time. So I wanna highlight that without the invention of tools, civilization and modern technology would not exist, and we would not have evolved as homo sapiens. Tool use was fundamental to cognition, adaptations, survival, dispersals, and evolution. So this is what chimpanzees do. For the earliest tools by humans, for example, we can see that we were taking flakes off and getting a sharp edge. And that was used for cutting, for cutting the meat from uh, an animal. But chimpanzees only crack open nuts. They don't modify the stone. They take what is available, two stones, what is available, and use uh, striking behavior to break open the nuts. And this has been excavated by archeologists as well. The oldest evidence of nut cracking by chimpanzees is about 4,000 years old. But the behavior probably is much older in reality. These are the oldest artifacts probably made by hominins, 3.3 million years old, coming from Kenya. Very simple technology. Again, not associated with meat eating. Keep in mind that not all stone tools means hunting or meat eating. You can do many, many things with stone tools, not just uh, eating meat. You can dig, you can uh, process vegetation, 
You can crack open nuts. And these are the different routes coming out of Africa. Uh, and you notice in the, the third one, which is connected to the Arabian Peninsula, that is the only one that was accessible continuously. The other three, Northern uh, Africa and Europe, and then you see on the bottom right, uh, Djibouti and Yemen. That Those three routes were depending on sea level fluctuations. Whenever the sea level went down, the land bridge was created and the animals and humans walked across. So there was a major uh, opportunity for them. And this happened, uh, keep in mind, is connected with the glacial environments. How can it be connected to glaciers is when glaciers melted, the sea level rose. When glaciers formed, the sea level dropped. So during glacial cycles, the hominins and animals could cross. During interglacial cycles, they could not cross. But later on, of course, uh, Homo sapiens with advanced technology and maybe uh, gradually using boats, for example, they could cross. Another factor for dispersal out of Africa is change in habitat. So I was talking about change from forest to grasslands and how we became bipedal. This process also goes out of Africa. Uh, I think you might have seen on the map how the deserts of today are connected from the Sahara Desert in Africa to the Tar Desert in India. It is all at the same latitudes. And that is because at one time before deserts, it was all a grassland environment. So grasslands was a key major factor for dispersal as well, not only bipedalism. For example, we have forest shifting to grasslands. Then we have all these herbivores adapted to grasslands. You must have seen many documentaries showing the savannas with buffalo, elephant, wildebeest, giraffe, zebra, all these animals moving. And even today we have evidence of long-term seasonal migration of the wildebeest crossing the rivers and the crocodiles attacking them. This process is going on for millions of years. And then we have a next uh, uh, stage is predators going after the herbivores, scavengers following the predators, and eventually hominins following everyone. So everything is a chain reaction. Climate change, ecological change, dispersal. And these dispersals were not intentional. The populations did not think that, okay, today I want to go to Israel from Africa. It was a very slow movement, unintentional. It was accidental. So what is the earliest evidence outside of Africa at the moment? Stone tools in China, 2.1 million years old. Human fossils in Europe and Southeast Asia, around 1.6 million years old, 1.7 million years old. So this is showing that humans left very early. To get to China by 2.1 million, they might have left by maybe 2.5 million, 2.6 million, we don't know. We need to find evidence closer to Africa. Then we can say what happens uh, later on. There's a question mark in India because we don't have this information. We don't have the earliest evidence yet. And this site, Damanisi, in uh, Europe is interesting because it is one site. So all the fossil sites that you know from Africa and China and Europe, usually you find one specimen or one fossil from the one site. But in Damanisi, they found five fossils in one site. And what is interesting is this, this site is just uh, a, a little bit larger than this room. And what is interesting is that all these fossils, five fossils from one site, are all different from each other. So the scientists are asking, does it represent a lot of variation, morphological variation in one species, or can it represent the presence of more than one species? If it does represent presence of one more than one species, why do we have fossils of more than one species in one location? They don't interact with each other, and they normally won't die together at the same time. So what's going on exactly? Is it because of uh, lions bringing in the dead humans, for example, and accumulating, everything's accumulating? It's not clear because this site has also yielded many stone tools. So we also try to understand how sites formed in the past. That explains a lot about human behavior. And another uh, fascinating thing about the earliest dispersal, you see this map of South Asia, a lot of islands are there. Sumatra, Flores, uh, Java, um, Borneo, all these islands, we find evidence of the earliest humans leaving Africa, 1.5 million years old. And what is fascinating is that 
they get there before the formation of islands. They get there when it was a landmass. On the right is the ancient uh, geography. On the left is the modern geography. So hominins arrive, sea level rises, and the islands form. What happens is all the hominins get trapped on the islands. And the hominins that get trapped in the islands, they actually shrink in size. They become smaller from uh, 1.5 meters in height to one meter in height. You can see the skull on the bottom. On the right, we have a normal Homo sapien today. And on the left, we have Homo floresiensis, which is also called the hobbit because of the size uh, in comparison. And they existed from one mil roughly 1 million years ago to 50,000 years ago. And this happens with other animals also. The, all, the elephants on the island become smaller. Why does this happen? This is a phenomenon called island dwarfism. When you have limited resources, and the best way for a species to survive is to become smaller and adapt to limited resources for longer survival. Interestingly, the rats, you can see the rats on the bottom, the rats become larger, but the elephants in humans become smaller. Now the question, big question we're asking is, how did Flor Homo floresiensis become extinct? Was Homo sapiens responsible for the extinction? Because we were definitely responsible for extinction of Neanderthals, but maybe other species also. Then we have other species such as Denisovans. And the only way we found out this is a separate species is by DNA. For example, you can see the bone here on the top right. That's a finger bone. A very small fragment was preserved in the cave from Siberia. And if you have a tiny fragment this size, we cannot identify a species. It's impossible. But we extracted DNA and found out it belongs to the Denisovans. And now we know today, today's populations, including Indians, have Denisovan DNA and Neanderthal DNA because of mixing with these populations in the past. African populations do not have any Neanderthal DNA because the Neanderthals never entered Africa and mixed with the populations. Here's another jaw fragment found in the Tibetan plateau, Denisovans. And what is interesting is that the DNA is showing us that today's, you know, uh, you, you know about the Sherpas living in Nepal, for example. You know about the people living in Tibetan plateau in high altitude zones. This happened, and our adaptation happened because of Denisovans. Denisovans passed down their genes of living in high altitudes to Homo sapiens. Other species in, in Europe, Europe and Asia, uh, red deer cave people, the Neanderthals, Homo floresiensis, uh, Denisovans, and many, many others probably. We have not found the fossils, so we cannot say who else was there. And around a million years ago, we have evidence of cannibalism. We, humans are possibly eating other humans. Now, this is based on cut marks. So if you use a stone tool to cut meat from the bone, the stone tool edge will leave a mark on the bone. So we have found stone tool marks on the back of the skull of the humans. So that can mean one possibility is it can mean uh, cannibalism, or it can mean uh, some kind of uh, ritual defleshing without consuming the meat. We don't know exactly if they consume the meat. Then we have evidence of violence. A lot of the skulls have uh, fractures, have uh, dents. So this shows possibly the beginning of violence in human societies. Intergroup and intergroup. So I'm basically going in chronological order from oldest evidence to youngest evidence. Then we come to the time period about half a million years ago, right when Homo sapiens is about to emerge in Africa, we have stone technology, which you see on the bottom right, is now becoming homogenous across the world. First in Africa, we have the earliest technologies emerging, but now we have the same technology emerging at different locations. Different uh, fossils emerging. And what is interesting is all these fossils at this time and the technologies show parallel evolution. They're similar, actually, in morphology, in anatomy. Why, how can, uh, how can this site here, which has, which has um, almost the earliest Homo sapiens in the world, resemble some fossils in China? 
We don't know exactly because the fossils are resembling each other, but the technologies are different. So if you think about long-term, uh, long-distance uh, interbreeding and mixing, if you hypothesize about that, then how do you explain the diversity in the stone tools? So this, it's contradicting each other. So we don't know what's going on. And now a new hypothesis about Homo sapiens. First, we thought that there's only one single origin in, in Africa. But now new evidence suggests that uh, this, this evidence I showed you, where different fossils are looking similar, same thing as in Africa. Different fossils across Africa at this time are looking similar. So now they think that we have more than one population uh, converging into Homo sapiens. Population in North Africa, East Africa, Central Africa, Southern Africa, converging. So parallel evolution into one species. Now, I told you about different species emerging, right? Now you can have, for example, all of you are familiar with horses and donkeys. What do, you, what do you get when you mix horses and donkeys? Mule. What kind of a species is a mule? Do you know the species name? It can't be a new species, technically, uh, biologically, because it is sterile. It cannot reproduce. It cannot pass on these genes. It's a hybrid. Okay? So scientists have also found, found evidence of hybrids. One uh, skeleton from, uh, I think, Port uh, uh, Siberia, they found out from the DNA, they found out that the mother was Denisovan and the father, well, the father was Denisovan and the mother was Neanderthal of that individual. That's a hybrid. So if, if the Neanderthals and Homo sapiens are interbreeding and we have their DNA, that means they were able to reproduce, unlike the mules. Now the question, the big question is that we're challenging question is biologically, is are Neanderthals and Homo sapiens the same species? If they're successfully interbreeding and their offspring are interbreeding and passing on their genes, unlike the mule, can we lump them into one species? This is a big debate now. We're actually changing the definition of a biological species because the Neanderthals emerge in Europe, Homo sapiens emerges in Africa. So we have multiple uh, populations. And this is also the beginning of culture. When I say culture, everybody knows what culture is today, but in the past, culture uh, emerges slowly. Different uh, stone tools in North Africa, different stone tools in South Africa. So now, uh, humans are establishing territorial boundaries, geographic boundaries, and they're making different uh, technologies in different locations. These are all made by Homo sapiens. And then another key question for coming to South India, uh, uh, South Asia, is when do hominids first arrive here, the Indian subcontinent? The role of uh, South Asia, you can see here on the map, is first of all, it's centrally located. It's connecting all the records from Africa to Australia, to China, to Europe. So it could have been made like a crossroads intersection of human movement. Other thing is that it has a long history of research just like Europe. And we have the oldest evidence going back to 1.5 million uh, in some cases. We have over 3,000 sites reported. All of these various technologies are represented from lower Paleolithic to upper Paleolithic and onwards, but we have very few dates. To talk about, to reconstruct the history of movement or the path of movement, we need actual dates. And dating is problematic because scientifically it's very challenging sometimes. The material is not enough or the context is ambiguous, but we're trying to get more dates and then we can compare with the global evidence. So basically recreating the pathway of movement based on the dates, oldest to youngest. What is the evidence for the oldest evidence in the subcontinent? We have sites reported from Central India and North India, especially Shualik Hills, which many of people are familiar with. Uh, and the Shualik Hills basically are parallel with the Himalaya from Pakistan, India, and Nepal. And some of you might have heard about Shiva Pithikas and Rama Pithikas, reported in the 1960s and 50s. This is actually thought to be a human ancestor for many, many decades uh, in, uh, in, 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 found in India, Pakistan, and Nepal. This specimen here was found in Pakistan. And for many decades, it was thought to be a human ancestor. And a lot of research was focused on India as well as Africa. 
But in the 1970s, we found out that it's actually ancestral to orangutans, not ancestral to humans. It was not bipedal, it was quadrupedal. It was arboreal, actually. So this shows that how our concept of human evolution is changing. Then the earliest stone tools reported from Shivalix, we have uh, things from Pakistan, and recently the site of Masol uh, reported from near Chandigarh. We can see, besides the stone tools, which are ambiguous and not coming from excavations, on the bottom we have a uh, bone, animal bone, with possible cut marks. If, it is, if it's made by humans, those cut marks, then it's possibly the oldest evidence of humans outside of Africa, 2.6 million years old. But it's again, uh, not clear cut, it's ambiguous, because these marks can be made by other processes also. But the habitats, as I was saying, suggest possible presence of humans. When we look for sites, we first look at the habitat. Was it conducive, ecologically conducive for occupation? I talked about uh, forest environments, grasslands. So Shivalix also shows similar evidence. Here we have a uh, multiple uh, list of animals from Georgia in Europe, Israel in Levant, Java, and then in India, the Pinjor formation, geological formation. And what is interesting is all the red species are different, uh, are uh, basically predators. All the purple species are elephants. All the yellow ones show crocodiles and hyenas and the blue ones show deer species. Across the world, basically what this shows is different animals suggest similar habitats. And except for India, all of these other sites have yielded animal, uh, human fossils. So showing evidence of humans based on similarity of habitat. So technically, the Shivalik Hills shows potential for human occupation at the same time. It's just a matter of time and luck until we find the fossils. Then the second technology out of Africa too is the Acheulean, which is a bit more complicated, but more symmetrical, more pointed. And this is usually associated with Homo erectus for many, many years. Its boundary is this, the gray area. For many years, it didn't seem to go beyond that area. But now we're finding sites in China and Korea uh, with similar technology. So earlier, before the discovery, we were asking why this technology does not reach China. But now our question has changed. Now we're asking, was this technology invented independently from the Western zone, or it represents connection with the Western zone, dispersal? So this is a big question we're asking right now. It's not always easy to identify independent innovation. We need a lot of analytical techniques. So possible migration route in Central Asia, if, if they went from west to east, we should find sites in Central Asia. We don't have any sites at the moment, it's blank. And then what species occupied India when Homo sapiens arrives? Uh, we only have very limited fossil evidence uh, coming from Hathora in Madhya Pradesh. This skull was found uh, in the 1980s. Again, we don't know what species it is. It's incomplete, only one part of the skull is found. But we know that it's not Homo sapiens, it's possibly a female and it coming from a secondary deposit, uh, so the age is unclear. So we cannot know the relationship with Homo sapiens. It could have been contemporary with Homo sapiens, or it could have been much, much older. These are some other fragments reported of human fossils, uh, uh, shoulder bones, rib fragments, arm bones. But again, we cannot say the species, because ribs look the same in many species. Based on archaeology, some have hypothesized that the Neanderthals had reached Pakistan, actually. This is based on the stone tools found. So these stone tools found in Pakistan resemble the stone tools found in Europe at Neanderthal sites. So just based on similarity and similar, similar technologies, we think that they might have reached uh, Pakistan and maybe even parts of India, we don't know. We need fossils. But the easternmost occurrence is China now. The Neanderthals reached China. So quick key question is, when did Homo sapiens arrive first and with which technologies? The fossil evidence suggests 38,000 based on evidence in Sri Lanka. The uh, stone tool evidence suggests 48,000, which is maybe small microliths. This is clearly Homo sapien made. And then we have DNA suggesting 60,000. And this is modern DNA, DNA belonging to tribal populations. And then we have middle Paleolithic, which some scientists say belongs to Homo sapiens. 
but we have no fossil evidence at this time. This is based only on similarity with African evidence. Now, a new discovery a few years ago has changed this hypothesis now, has challenged the hypothesis. We have a younger middle Paleolithic, which is possibly by made by Homo sapiens or introduced by Homo sapiens. But if that's true, then that, that is challenged because now we have an older middle Paleolithic at 385,000 years ago. So if you have an older middle Paleolithic, that means the younger middle Paleolithic could have been made by another species, not necessarily Homo sapiens. Or it's possible that the same technology was made by different species over time. It's not easy to identify species based on the artifacts. Very challenging. Another big question, debate in India, is volcanic eruption. Some of you might have heard of the Toba volcano. It's in Southeast Asia, right? 74,000 years ago, there was a super eruption. The eruption was so large that the ash reached all the way to Africa. You can see on the map, Southern Africa and Eastern Africa, they found the ash. It was in the air for thousands of years. And the largest amount of ash in land context is in India. So the question is, what kind of impact did it have? Did the eruption affect the vegetation? Did the eruption affect climate, animal life, and uh, by proxy, uh, prehistoric human adaptations and their technologies? There's a big debate right now between scientists. Some say major change occurred, some say no change occurred. Of course, the humans continued, they didn't become extinct, but behavioral changes and adaptive changes happened. So we need to find out exactly what happened. And we also have to remember that change probably occurred variably across India. Maybe more uh, change happened in Southeast India and less change happened in Northwest India, for example. Did hominids hunt some animals to extinction? This is a question that is being asked for Africa, Australia, North America, and now it's being asked for India. For example, we have these five species becoming extinct between 40,000 and 10,000 years ago. Two species of elephants, one uh, wild horse species, one wild cattle species, hippo species, and ostrich. A lot of people don't realize that in India, we had ostriches and hippos. And today, you know that rhinoceros is found mostly in Northeast India. But earlier, rhinoceros were everywhere. Lions today are only in Gujarat, but lions were everywhere before. So what is happening now? Why are these animals becoming marginalized geographically? And why are these species becoming extinct? So one possible role is that maybe humans had a role to play by hunting, maybe. We don't have direct evidence of hunting yet compared to other places, but maybe a combination of climate change hunting, and our, uh, what would you say, uh, ecological encroachment on their, on their territory. One fossil was found in Kashmir many years back, an elephant fossil with stone tools. This is just one example. Now, it's ambiguous in India, but in North America, for example, with you might, have, you might be the most knowing mammoths, right? Mammoths are large elephants, extinct elephants. In North America, there are many, many sites with mammoth hunting and butchery evidence. But in India, we don't have this evidence. So we can't say for sure that humans had a major role to play. Which fossil clusters like this are rare? We find individual fossils, sometimes the uh, tooth or cranial fragment or rib fragment, but complete cluster like this is rare. That we need clusters like this to understand the extinction process. Sometimes we have stone tools on the right, animal fossils on the left come mixed together, but it's a geological site. It's not a butchery site. They're mixed by geological processes. When we're trying to understand this by looking at fossils in Narmada Valley as well. Why are uh, all these species becoming extinct? Did humans have a role to play, for example, in the extinction? So how would technology change in relation to habitat change? We imagine that we have a, we have a grasslands with large, anim, large mammals. And what is needed for large mammals is spears large stone points attached to spears for hunting. Gradually, there's climate change. Grasslands decrease, forest environments increase. The large mammals become less in number. So does the frequency of spears. Less large mammals means less spears. Eventually, 
We have forest environments dominated by small mammals, and then the technology changes to bow and arrow. So this is a hypothetical scenario of how climate change and habitat change leads to technological change. In India, we have technologies of hunting from about the last half million years. It shows presence of uh, hunting behavior. We don't have the direct evidence yet, but it shows presence that they had knowledge of hunting. We have points found middle Paleolithic, upper Paleolithic, and Mesolithic. We also have arrow, uh, arrowheads as well, not just spear points. And we also have rock paintings showing evidence of butchery. So clearly, meat eating was going on, but we don't know the amount of meat eating. We don't know how much hunting was going on daily basis. Now, ostriches. Ostriches are in India uh, for at least the last 60,000 years. And before that, they were found about 2 million years context. But at least for the last 60,000 years, we had ostriches. And their shells were made into beads sometimes in the Stone Age. And of course, uh, the ostrich eggs were used for food. So targeting the eggs, even for one generation, can kill off an entire population of ostrich. Here's a distribution of ostriches, mostly in arid zones, dry environments like Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Maharashtra. We don't have ostriches in Eastern India, Northeast India, or extreme South. But we know that they were present up to 10,000 years ago and maybe later. This is an engra engraving specimen I'll talk about in, in a minute. So finally, I'm getting to the last topic of my talk is what about prehistoric symbolic behavior in India? Symbolic behavior, I told you about burials and rock paintings, things like this. The earliest evidence of symbolic behavior is shell beads, 100,000 years old, made by homo sapiens in Africa and Levant. We don't have this in India. I'm just highlighting what is known from other regions and what is absent in India. Here's an engraved ochre specimen, just this big, make, make uh, engraving with, sharp, with a sharp uh, implement into geometric lines. What is the meaning of this? We don't know. Is this abstract art? Maybe it means something, maybe it doesn't mean something. And then famous figurines from Europe carved by humans. And this happens only after Homo sapiens arrives. It's not done by Neanderthals. It's not done by other species. Most of the symbolic behavior is restricted to Homo sapiens. So that is one question we're asking is, were other species capable of human behavior? In India, the, uh, the symbolic behavior is dominated by paintings like this in the, shel in the shelters and caves. And you can see prehistoric style to historical style. In fact, the painting was, is still done sometimes by some tribal groups. It's a continuous tradition. We also have engravings like this in Maharashtra. Maharashtra, Goa, uh, I think also, I think if I'm not wrong, I think Karnataka also in the Konkan zone. So this is where these kind of shelters with smooth surface did not exist. Yeah. Uh, so the smooth surface did not exist. So what, the, what other option did they have was the ground, a ground of laterite with the engraved animals. But we don't know the age. This could be 5,000 years old. It could be 500 years old. It could be 10,000 years old. We don't know the age. It's easy to date. It's easier to date paintings, but not engravings. We're working on this project in Concord Zone also. Here are some uh, engraved specimens. You remember the, the, Austria, the, sorry, the ochre specimen I showed you here? This ochre specimen, look at the design here. Parallel lines, cross hatching, and then look at the ostrich eggshell. Same design. It means that a hard surface leads to straight lines. So we have similarities. We have hundreds of specimens in Africa, but only one specimen in India so far. It means that the entire egg was carved when it was whole. So finally, I would just like to highlight uh, the importance of this subject uh, for scientists. Why study archaeology and human evolution? So I'll just break it into two parts. One is 
I would just like to highlight that knowledge or curiosity about the past and in general should not have topical boundaries or limits. It should be holistic. All knowledge leads to empowerment and becomes useful at some point in time. For example, in the past, we did made a lot of discoveries, sometimes accidental scientific discoveries, chemical discoveries in biology, DNA, and even today we are exploring outer space. So we're doing a lot of things and getting knowledge. This knowledge is very important, if not in the present, sometimes in the future as well. And we should not keep boundaries of what's knowledge and be selective, that we should learn this and we should not learn this. The more we learn, the more empowered we become eventually as a species. And in terms of archaeology, we can get insights from the past for living in the present and living in the future. For example, what climatic patterns should we expect in the future? The glacial cycles have been occurring in a specific manner over millions of years, but that manner of occurrence is not predictable. It's not that every 100,000 years, there's going to be a glacial period. That actually is fluctuating because of the way the earth tilts when it's spinning, the speed of spinning, as well as the shape of its, its uh, revolving around the sun, that path. That's why we have seasons today, winter, summer, spring. So that matters about what we find in the past in terms of sediments like fauna, flora, and sea level fluctuations. We can possibly predict the pattern in the future. When will be the next ice age, for example? How can we use our knowledge to prevent future animal extinctions? If you were responsible for extinctions, how can we use that information to preserve fauna in the future? Even today, many species are becoming extinct. Maybe in the next uh, 10 years, uh, some species such as uh, gorillas, for example, might become extinct. Elephants might become extinct. We don't know. The only animals we have left are the ones in zoos. How did past human populations cope with changing environments? If it was an arid zone or a humid zone or a specific glacial environment, how did we actually adapt? This actually helps us in looking at sustainable living. We use modern technology for everything, but sometimes it's not eco-friendly. Just because we can uh, you know, establish uh, air conditioners in our room and feel more comfortable, doesn't mean it's actually helping the environment. We can learn from past examples of eco-friendly structures, eco-friendly construction, and sustainable living at a long-term uh, possibility. And finally, coming to the relevance of ancient DNA. There's two types of DNA that we study. One is looking at modern DNA, and one is looking at ancient DNA. And amazingly, there's new sources of DNA being found now. We are finding, new, making new breakthroughs in the, in the discipline. For example, if you don't have fossils, ancient fossils, where else can we get ancient DNA? Can anyone guess? Some of you might have seen in the news a few years ago. Where does ancient DNA come from besides fossils? No, we don't have fossils. Imagine we don't have fossils. Existing? Livestock. Livestock. So that is going to, now the limitation of modern DNA of any animal is that it only tells the history of that uh, lineage. It doesn't tell the history of past lineages. But if you look at the DNA of Homo erectus, for example, of Denisovans, Neanderthals, it tells us about extinct, extinct species as well, right? So another source of DNA that we're finding now, besides fossils, is actually environmental DNA. We're digging the cave sites, and in the sediments, we're finding DNA without any fossils, without any bones. So imagine that. Imagine the breakthrough that's happening. Of course, the preservation has to be exceptional, like a glacial uh, zone, like Europe, Siberia, some cold environment where DNA is preserved. And the DNA can come from hair. It can come from saliva. It can come from urine, from feces, from bones that are destroyed now. It, various sources of DNA. Uh, even in uh, Greenland, two million years ago, they just took sediments and they found out the presence of over one dozen species of animals and plants. So it's not necessary to only get uh, DNA from fossils, but now we have sediments also. And why this is relevant is ancient DNA is informing us about our adaptive capabilities, such as high altitude survival and how our immune systems are respond to different types of infections. So medically, it's very important. That is why you might have read 
that the uh, main DNA expert who, who revolutionized this subject, uh, Swante Pabo, he actually got a Nobel Prize uh, for this work recently. And then coming to the last part, the relevance of human evolutionary studies. All of us know that we live in a world of violence and inequality, especially India, Africa, all these developing zones, developing nations. By better understanding and appre appreciating the past and present human diversity, it can lead to a better future of humanity. We all share the same ancestors and we are all equal. So that's why how human evolution can play a role in changing modern mindsets about uh, bias. For example, even in the West, we still have racial bias. In India, we have ethnic bias. All of these things can actually help us uh, become better humans by studying the past and how diversity started and actually spread everywhere. So that is the main uh, topic of my talk. And I just wanted to say one last thing is that it is our moral responsibility to preserve our heritage as individuals. You can see that many sites are getting destroyed. And one problem with this is the lack of legislation or lack of policy. In the West, for example, I was telling uh, Praveen that in the West, we have a law. If there's going to be a mall constructed in one location, archeologists are hired first to test that area to make sure there's no archeological evidence. And only then the mall construction is allowed. If something is found, it is salvaged. If something is not found, they're given the green light. In India, there are no such laws. We cannot preserve everything all the time. Of course, that's impossible. There's lack of resources, lack of time, lack of funding, but it is our moral obligation to do what we can. And I hope that as future lawyers, you'll help us preserve our own heritage in different ways. Thank you very much. Sir, I agree with the fact that uh, fossils and the environmental changes has led to the main factors being considered as the evidence for the evolution. Uh, but there's also some articles which were led that uh, there was uh, irreducible complexity in the cells of uh, the DNAs which were found earlier. And uh, I just want to uh, want you to uh, comment on, uh, on the study which was uh, left by the BBC in uh, 2011, which says that human evolution was uh, from fishes. Human evolution took place from the fishes. And in accordance to that, there was a group uh, which led in uh, uh, 2021 from China that there were five fishes, Silurian fishes, which were uh, resemblance of uh, and the evidence for human evolution. Okay, so I'm not familiar with that specific study, but if you look at it from an entire geological timeline, all these individual uh, animals or fauna are connected. So the fishes are the earliest life form that appear, one of the earliest life forms that appear. And of course, their descendants eventually leads to, uh, for example, uh, other animals, the dinosaurs, mammals, hominins, everything. So if you go far back in time, we do have ancestral evidence of that. But I cannot comment on that last study that they're talking about, 2021. Uh, the last one, and uh, you said that they found there are two kinds of species uh, which were discovered recently. And I wanted to know whether uh, you said you showed a place where you found uh, more than five kinds of species in the same place. Five, five skulls. Uh, five skulls, which is of different species. Maybe. Uh, Maybe. Uh, when we comment about that, we can say that one species was might be a human and another was uh, uh, an ape or something. And uh, the evolution or the uh, generation from them led to the another species. Yes. So that might have happened. Yes, correct. So it's all about uh, competition, for example. Uh, it's all about climate change. There's other factors also that can lead to speciation. Uh, mutation rates. Muta mutation rates in the genes can change. And those are not predictable. They happen randomly. Just like the mutation that we, that we are adapted to high altitude environments, like Tibetan Plateau, Himalaya, those, that's because of a mutation in our genes. So sometimes uh, there's factors that affect the evolution, and sometimes there's uh, things that happen accidentally. Just like the horse and the 
the donkey mutation, we can also find such uh, differences for we can. human. And we can. And yeah, so uh, the, I told you three species that uh, interbred Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, and Denisovans. Maybe we also interbred with Homo erectus in the past. We don't know. Until we find the evidence, we cannot say for sure. So we have a question online. What happened when the migration moved in Southeast Asia and Northeast India? Uh, Southeast Asia and Northeast India. Uh, so I didn't show that slide, but if you look at the uh, evidence so far, we don't have we don't have evidence of Paleolithic populations in Northeast India at the moment. Everything that is found so far in Northeast India is Neolithic. So there seems to be population movement from Southeast Asia into Northeast India. So the Paleolithic populations have come from Northwest India. But if you look at the younger populations, like Neolithic populations, they emerge at different locations at the same time. So at the moment, there is a disconnect in the Pleistocene, but there's a connection in the Holocene between Southeast Asia and Northeast India. But we need more surveys. Uh, absence of evidence doesn't mean evidence of absence. There's very less research done in, in Northeast India. So maybe in the future, we might find cave sites or other sites with uh, older evidence, and then we can try to make connections with Southeast Asia. But it's not always so easy. For example, if we do find hypothetically something in Northeast India, how do we know where it came from? Did it come from the West, Western side, or did it come from Southeast Asian side? It'd be challenging, but, but we can hopefully find some information. My question is, as you said, climate change leads to technological changes, and technological changes invariably leads to economic advancement. And in the absence of legislation and the over increasing of the, and the infrastructure development that is going on in India, what roles do lawyers play? So first, just one uh, point about uh, environmental change. There are sites where we'd have climate change happening, but the technology is not changing. So there are exceptions sometimes. They're adapting and they're just managing with the same technology, but the functions are changing of the technology. Technology, not only with respect to the finding of the fossils, but also with the way humans are working, uh, humans are advancing. Yes, like, yes. Like sometimes this process of thread, the uh, archaeological site itself might be. Okay, I'll give you one example. And this is a. Uh, it's a moral question. There's no right answer or wrong answer. Is there something to think about? For example, uh, there's the mineral cobalt and that is used in cell phones. Now we find the cobalt source. Should we mine it? Because it's a source that's going to help us economically and technologically for more cell phones and more technology. Or should we think about how it's going to affect the local environment and the local tribals who, uh, for, for them, that area is uh, holy, for example. So we have to think about these things, about the give and take. We always have to think about how much progress and the speed of progress is necessary. The legislation we can get of the present, but also for preserving the past. This is, that's, that's what I was saying. There is no legislation to preserve the past. There are laws, for example, that you cannot excavate, excavate a site without a permission. There are laws that you cannot collect things without permission. There's those are those laws are established, but there are no laws, like I said about in the West, where you have uh, commercial archaeology or salvage archaeology, where you can actually test the area before construction continues. There are no such laws existing at the moment, and that's why I was saying that that's where uh, lawyers have a major role to play in trying to establish these policies and with all the stakeholders, with archaeologists, with the public, with the landowners, everybody. Thanks. Can silk route be a possible order channel for ancient human migration in Indian subcontinent? Uh, I didn't hear the first part. Silk route. Silk route. Be a possible order channel for ancient human migration in Indian subcontinent. Yeah, I think any possible, any, there's any possibility in human evolutionary studies. I don't think we should restrict ourselves to specific 
uh, knowledge that has been gained or specific evidences. I think uh, all possibilities exist. For example, we assume that the Himalayas were a barrier from uh, Tibetan Plateau into India. But maybe they were able to cross. We don't know for sure. Maybe they were adapted, so well adapted, that they were able to cross back and forth. And it was not actually a barrier. So I do think that all these uh, hypothetical scenarios that we have actually uh, raised in the last few decades should be tested properly. We shouldn't assume that there is no archaeological evidence. We should actually survey and confirm there is no archaeological evidence and then scientifically explain why it's absent. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, sir, for an insightful and informative lecture. I now request Pravin, sir, to present a sapling to Dr. Pardhar Chauhan, our eminent guest lecture of today's special lecture as a token of gratitude. Here we come to an end of our special lecture on Aid to Humans, Evaluation of Human in India. I now request Chandralekha, President of Heritage Club from third year BALLB to deliver the vote of thanks. A very good afternoon to all. Respected and our most distinguished chief guest of the day, Professor Dr. Uh, Pate Chahan, respected principal Dr. J. Malika Jinea, sir, in his absentia, uh, vice principal Dr. Anita M. J. Ma'am, and IQSC coordinator Dr. Manoj Kumar V. Hiramat, sir, honorable professors, and my dear friends. I give it a great honor to propose the vote of thanks to all who have helped us in making this special lecture a successful one. First of all, I would like to propose hearty vote of thanks to our esteemed guest, Dr. Pate Chahan, uh, for gracing today's special lecture, sir. Thank you, sir, for your very interesting and thought-provoking address. I also thank the teaching fraternity and non-teaching staff for their participation. I would also like to thank all the board members of the Heritage Club and the coordinators for making this special lecture a great success. Finally, the wonderful students who have turned up in such great numbers. Thank you so much for your cooperation. Once again, thank you all for your cordial cooperation. Thank you and have a great day ahead. Thank you.